In all of the previous videos, we have been signing data locally and sending it to a remote node over HTTP to broadcast to the Ethereum network. But right now, we're going to run our own node and broadcast to the network directly. In order to run our own node, first we are going to need to sync the blockchain. The command to sync the blockchain is super simple. It's just literally the word get and then hit enter. And there you go, you're syncing the Ethereum main network to a local node. But I'm gonna just cancel out of that because there are a couple things that we wanna know before we actually go ahead and do this. First, let's talk about where the blockchain is actually going to live. A key concept in Geth is the data directory. If you run the command geth help, it will show you a bunch of different flags that you can pass into the geth command. One of which is this dash dash data dir flag right here. By default, the data directory is going to live at slash home slash Ubuntu slash dot Ethereum. But if you want it to live somewhere different, you have to pass in that dash dash data dir flag and specify where you want to read or write data from each time. In this example, I'm just going to make a new directory in dot Ethereum called mainnet and use that as my data directory for the main chain. So now I'm going to rerun that get command, only I'm going to pass in dash dash data dir dot ethereum slash mainnet. And I'm going to wait a minute just for this to start syncing blocks. Okay, and now that geth has started to synchronize blocks, I'm just going to cancel out of it. And then I'm going to cd into that dot ethereum mainnet directory, and I'm going to run an ls. And I'll see that there's two folders right here that have been created for me, geth and keystore. First, I'm going to cd into that get folder and again run a ls, and I'll see that I have a folder called chain data. This is where the Ethereum blockchain is actually going to live. If I cd into that folder right now and I run another ls, I'll see that I have this .ldb file. LDB stands for Level DB, which is a database that was built by Google in 2011 and then open sourced. Level DB is meant to efficiently store arbitrary key value pairs on disk. There's no reason specifically that the Ethereum blockchain has to be stored in level DB. It's just a performance decision that the Geth team made. Parity, for example, uses a fork of level DB called rocks DB to store the blockchain in. If I, if I go back to um, this LDB file and I cat it, so cat, 5.ldb, you'll see that it's just a bunch of absolute nonsense. Um, you can't just like read these files directly, they're database dumps. So if you want to read the actual blockchain data, you're going to need to have to query through a level DB interface. And Geth will conveniently provide one of these for us. Before we sync the blockchain for reals, it might be helpful to understand at a super high level what this synchronization process is actually going to entail. So the Ethereum network stores the state of the entire network, that's every single contract on the network, at any given time in what's called the state tree. Now, let's say, for example, we are looking at the state of the Ethereum network at block 10,000, and it's in this data structure here. Well, what's going to happen? A miner is going to mine a new block and transact it to the network. Let's say this is block 10,001. And this block is going to have a variety of different transactions in it that have been mined together into a block. Well, in order for a node to process this block, it is going to need to apply those transactions to the state at block 10,000 and transition the state to what the new state should be at block 10,001 after all the transactions have been processed. This entire system of processing the blocks uses what's called the state transition process. And this state transition process is what all of that crazy math in the yellow paper is describing. Now, in addition to transitioning the state from one tree to another, the state transition process is going to produce a variety of different artifacts as well. One example would be the transaction receipts for each individual transaction. The transaction receipts are things that describe, for example, how much gas an individual transaction actually consumed as it was processed. Now, all of this all, all of these steps of processing the blocks, transitioning the state, producing the transaction receipts, that not only takes time to do, but it expends computational resources as well. Right now, if you were just to run that geth command and try to sync the blockchain, it would probably store about 70 gigabytes of data onto your hard drive, and it would also take about a day to run. Now, fortunately, you don't need to actually do all of this processing every time that you want to run a full node. 
there are a series of different optimizations you can do to make the synchronization process go a lot faster. Let's look at one example. One thing you might want to do is instead of actually running this state transition function locally on your machine to transition the state to the next block and generate the TX receipts, well, maybe you could just download the new state and the transaction receipts from the network. So you could just download them from a node that has conceivably already done the processing to generate the new state. This would effectively be trading bandwidth for processing power because you're just downloading it instead of actually running the process to transition the state. And this will end up being a lot quicker on your computer than trying to generate the new state and TX receipts for every single block. Another thing you could potentially do is just completely ignore the previous states and say, okay, well, I just need the most current state of the network and I don't need to know what the state was after each individual block because that's historical data. And that would make not only storage a lot quicker, but it would make the synchronization process a lot faster too because you're not downloading historical states. Geth has built-in functionality to sync the blockchain using these optimizations. Normally, when we throw away the historical state and only store the current state, this is what we call a light client. And light clients are really useful when you either need to sync the blockchain extremely fast or just you're using a memory constrained device like a mobile phone or Raspberry Pi or something like that. Um, if you want to run a light client in Geth, all you need to do is run the Geth command using the dash dash light flag and that will start it in light client mode. You can also do what's called a fast sync, which you run using the dash dash fast flag. And the fast sync will do what I described, where it just downloads the TX receipts instead of processing each block itself, essentially trading CPU processing power for bandwidth, which makes the entire process go faster. Um, one note though, if you're gonna use a fast sync and use dash dash fast, you actually cannot have started to sync the blockchain already. So if you have any kind of partial sync, you won't be able to use a fast sync. You actually have to delete your entire sync and then start from scratch with a fast sync. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that folder I made in .ethereum mainnet. I'm just gonna blow it away and then I will remake it in .ethereum mainnet. And then I'm gonna run geth dash dash fast dash dash data dir dot ethereum slash mainnet. And this will go ahead and this will start my synchronization to that mainnet folder using the fast sync. Now, another thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to another tab here and I'm gonna CD into that directory. And if I run an ls-la, I see that I have this geth.ipc file that has been created. IPC stands for interprocess communication and it provides a way for me to run a console and get information about the sync that is currently going on. So I'm going to run geth attach and then I'm going to do dot slash geth dot IPC. So then geth attach and then the path to the IPC file and that will open a console that is connected to the geth node. Now, if I want to see the current status of the synchronization, I can do this function called f dot syncing. And you'll see that f.syncing says that it's at the current block is 929 that it has synced so far. The highest block that it knows about is block 3.5 million, which is the current highest block on the Ethereum main network at the time that I'm running this command. So I can look at the process of the synchronization as it's going on. And this is just a Node.js console, very similar to the Decipher TV CLI or just you know any other not JavaScript environment that you're familiar with. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this sync and then I'll come back in a minute. And you'll note that as the get fast sync starts to get close to the end, that it will start just importing blocks. It won't start downloading the state. So at some point, around a thousand or so blocks away from the current head the get knows about, it will stop downloading state and it'll switch to a normal synchronization where it's just downloading the blocks and processing the state as normal. And once your chain is finished syncing, that f.syncing command will return false. And if I cd into .ethereum mainnet slash geth and then do a du.h on chain data, I'll see that chain data is around 15 gigs using the fast sync. So that's the current size of the Ethereum database. And if you wanted to sync an Ethereum light client, you could just do geth dash dash light. Um, I've already actually done this. So if I go to um, Ethereum and then main light, 
and then into that get directory. And if I do an ls, I'll see that I don't have a chain data folder, but I have a folder called light chain data. So I could do du-h on the light chain data, and I'll see that the entire Ethereum database running a light client is only around 320 megabytes, so much more suitable for memory constrained devices. One more thing to note, when I run this um, sync command on the Ethereum mainnet, you'll notice that you have this thing here that says network ID one. That is because each version of the Ethereum network has its own ID associated with it. So for example, if I wanted to sync the Robston test network instead of the Ethereum main network, I just need to pass in the network ID for that network. In the case of Robston, the network ID is three. So when I do my get sync, I would do dash dash data dir and specify a new data dir for the Robston network um, dot slash whatever. And then I would do dash dash network ID as three so that it knows to sync the Robston network instead of the Ethereum network. Or I could just, and, and remember, because the geth client has the Robston Genesis block hard-coded into it, it will know how to do this properly. If I was making a private Ethereum network that I just wanted to be a custom network, I would need to make some you know, random slug to serve as the network ID so all the nodes on the network knew how to talk to each other and sync the blockchains from each other.